Hey, haven't you ever sinned? Well, we all we all sin. Well, um, once I sneaked an extra piece of peach cobbler pie at the Bible camp picnic. No, no. no haven't you ever lusted for someone? I mean, haven't you? Uh, oh, you just wanted them so bad you could taste it, man. Well, one time I peeked through a hedge and saw Minister Bob mowing his lawn in his Bermuda shorts. <laughs> and to fight my demonic urges, I popped a butter rum lifesaver and sucked away like there was no tomorrow. Now, who was it, church lady, that, uh, you know, that prompted you to spy through the hedge and pop the lifesaver? I mean, was that maybe, uh, let's see, was it maybe Satan? Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Sin Beef Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Gary Hill. With me tonight is Iris. Hello, hello. How you doing, boys? Fine, fine, fine. And with you tonight, uh, making his uh, grandiose comeback, you know, after uh, t- touring, um, I don't know, places and the, and the subcontinent. I had a whole plan for this, this segment, you know, but Cap Calloway is no longer with us. Uh, m- m- Mr. Jeffrey X. Martin, how you doing, sir? You know? I'm doing all right. How are we all doing tonight? Fine. Good. Do- doing good. Be fine. <laughs> good, glad. I'm glad. I-, I don't sound enthusiastic, but I'm glad you're here. Let's put it that way. And Iris, too. You know, I'm a little bit low energy tonight, too, so that's that's fine. <clears throat> Sweating too. Too much, too much fresh air. I blame the fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> so much oxygen just makes me feel like hell. <sighs> T- too much oxygen, you get M. Light Shyamalan movie, so... <laughs> you get the happening people and you get mocked what air what you know it's the air that was killing people or something in that movie i don't know it's weird but um <laughs> i'll uh stick to our guns and ask our our back to forum co-host they he thought people didn't want him back that's a lie jeffrey x martin Such what, a what, lie. What, what, what have you been watching lately man you know, not not a whole lot, but I will say this. You know, I'm always on the hunt for devil movies. You know, for 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 Kiss the Goat, and I like things that I've never heard of. And I found this movie called Seven Women for Satan from 1975. It's a French movie, and I mean, the title alone is just that's an elevator pitch. You know, Seven Women for Satan. It's women. It's the devil. I mean, that's just right up my street. So guess what? No devil in this movie at all. Um, I lost count of the number of women. There might have been seven. I think it was more like five and a half. I'm not sure. Um, but it's about this guy who is, he's a sadist. He's extremely rich, has like some kind of corporate job. I guess he's like French psycho instead of American psycho. But the deal is he is allegedly the son of Count Boris Zaroff, who was the antagonist in the most dangerous game. So I think he's, yeah, I think he's like, I don't know. It's like the real life descendant of the fictional character. Are they both, I guess they're both fictional characters. He can do that, but it kind of takes place in an expanded part of the most dangerous game universe, which is weird and really has no bearing on the rest of the film. um, Except that this guy picks up women and hunts them down in like, probably the dumbest ways possible it's a secret spin-off it's you know, kind of like the abraxas was to the principal you know <laughs> when jim belushi shows up in that movie as the same character for no reason you know dude listen okay i'm, I'm gonna be a little bit how spoilery can we get on this show uh, you're fine Okay, I mean, it's cool. 1971 and 78. I mean, okay, cool, on. cool, cool. I got some shit to say about one of these movies. Anyway, in the first act of Seven Women for Satan, the dude picks up a woman named Stephanie, takes her back to his, you know, French villa, and spends the night licking champagne off of her naked body. Nice. And then, right, and then the next morning, he just slaps the hell out of her and then apologizes. Literally, he's like, pap, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And then he kicks her in the ribs, oh. and he's like, and then he's like, oh, I wasn't myself, please come back. But she runs off, and so he runs her down with his car. Oh, nice. So it's a sadistic sequence of actions, but it still manages to somehow be boring as fuck. He's not the devil. He's 
a naughty, naughty boy. And then there's a ghost for some reason, and there's a torture chamber. And the next thing you know, 90 minutes have passed, which feels like three hours. So, I mean, it's a pretty movie, but it's just boring as shit. So, you know, yay for the women, but there's no devil. So fuck that. So he's basically pulling the... So it's kind of like... Go uh, oh, go ahead, Gary. No, go, 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 girl. go ahead. No, so it's kind of like the story of O, but with killing in it. And without Udo Kier. Okay. Well, yeah, you have to have Udo Kier. I... <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're going to watch something like the story of O, he has to be there. Right. But this, yeah, nothing, not even close. Not, oh, not even how close. sad. It's very sad. Wasted potential. Udo Kier uttered one of my favorite lines of cinematic history. You know, to, to know death, you must fuck life in the gallbladder. It's just, it's amazing. There you go. You know? Yep. That's it. <laughs> oh my gosh. But uh, yeah, that's it. Um, Iris. Yes. What have you been watching lately, girl? Oh my god. So I have been doing like some serious project work uh, for work, and um, I put on these stupid things in the background <laughs> just you know for noise i have managed to go through so many shock docs it's not even funny i've seen the Amityville horror one the exorcism of roland doe devil's road the mothman sightings the jersey devil <laughs> i mean jesus and then i've gone through the whole season three and four of celebrity hauntings, which is kind of interesting to watch. They had one of, of you know, uh, the man, the hammer, you know, exploitation dude himself. Nice. Uh, where he feels that he used to be, he had a past life, that he was a gladiator. It, it was just, it, it was very compelling. Um, is this the hammer's ego talking or is there prominence to this? Uh, no, no, there's actually, there is some prominence. Um, he was talking about, you know, the first time that he had gone over to Rome because he was going to be one of his first films. It's basically how he broke into, you know, the scene. And uh, he was walking around Rome and he just felt compelled to walk a certain way. And it really freaked him out. And then the psychic lady talked to, the, to him and said, hey, you know, your past life, you were a gladiator. That's where you were. And, I mean, he gets all teary eyed and everything. I was like, oh, my God, this guy really believes it. But then my daughter reminds me, she's like, Mom, they're actors. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this like, could be a little bullshit. I don't know. Let, let, let us have Maximus three the nomination, okay? Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, i just been watching shit TV, man. I mean, oh, I did watch uh, that Angelina Jolie movie, um, For Those Who Want Me Dead. I hear mixed things. <gasps> I really liked it. That's and then good. I watched uh, Mortal Kombat. And um, I'm mixed. I'm mixed on that myself. I liked it. OK. You know what? I liked I like the 19 or the 2000, what, the 1991 better, to tell you the uh, truth. Well, you know, the guy that played Kano, he, his back really hurts from carrying that movie on his back the whole time. You know? Yes. It's, it's... Yes. He, yes, he did. Um, uh, oh, and then I watched Cruella, of course. That was lots of fun. I was, was very, very impressed with that one. OK. I mean, I think it was worth the thirty dollars I paid for it because you know, had I gone to the theater, I would have gone with someone. I would have thought I would have taken Victor, and it would have been you know when we went to go see um, Godzilla vs King Kong in the movie theater, that was forty bucks worth of movie. We'll talk about it after the show, Iris. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a better a better way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but anyway, so yeah, uh, that's pretty much it, man. Just shit TV and just uh, the latest movies that have been out. I have to ask, since you've been watching Shock Docs, did you watch Demon House? Oh my god, yes! I fucking love Demon House, and I will die on that hill. Yes! That is... You know what? As much as I hate that man, it was very compelling, and I kind of liked it. But he was just so... Who's that? I don't know. I really like Demon House. That was good. I'm a big Ghost Adventures fan anyway, but man, I've watched Demon House like three times, and and it's the uncensored version is just so great because mm. it's just it's just it's on Discovery Plus, and he's just like, this is the case that really fucked me up. <laughs> yeah, like, and right. What? <laughs> right. I know. I know. So um, and actually, you know, I Discovery Plus. That's where I'm watching all my shit TV right now. <laughs> 
Yes. Discovery Plus is Discovery. awesome. I'm getting ready to start Ancient Aliens because aliens. <laughs> yeah. It, it doesn't work without the hands. You know, just, <laughs> I know. I know. Just picture it, people. And my hair is a mess. Like nude from aliens, you know, the, the mostly one. Yeah. It's very, very, tall, very tall hair. <laughs> very, very tall hair is like because aliens. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, and then there's been a podcast I've been listening to called uh, Strange Arrivals. Which, um, I mean, if you're into the UFO thing, it, you know, go listen to it. it it's got two seasons, two seasons. The first season is um, Barney and Betty Hill, which to me, very compelling. Though Betty kind of kind of blew the wad afterwards once, uh, you know, Barney had passed away. She was taking pictures and, <laughs> oh my God, the things that she was saying was, I mean, she blew her credibility, but um, very compelling. And then um, season two, which I just started is about the um, the Ronheim, basically Britain's um, Roswell. Yeah, there's a lot of controversy there, but, you know, it's just nerdy stuff. People like that kind of thing. You know, my, yeah. my sister my sister lives on Discovery Plus, too, but it's she likes, uh, she fell into the true crime stuff, so there's plenty of that on there. Oh, true crimes is good. True crimes is good. But, yeah, that's basically it. Well, that's all I've been doing is working and watching crap TV. Yeah. I watch Cruella, too. And Cru- Cru- Cruella as well, and I uh, I dug it. I didn't expect to dig it as much as I did, but it it all right. kind of it all kind of came together, and it, it was did. enjoyable. And the soundtrack was wonderful, mm-hmm. and Emma Stone was wonderful, and Emma Thompson were wonderful, and I uh, I had a good time with it. I'd recommend it. You know, I, people you know spit all over the live action Disney stuff. I I don't I don't see it. You know. This was fun. It was it was more adult than for children. So keep that in it mind. Was. If you want to you want to watch it with your kids, they might not feel the same way you do. You know, I, I described it on Lee Russell's show as um, <laughs> "Devil Wears Prada meets the Joker." So <laughs> yes. you watch that, yeah. You know? Oh my God! Yes, that's exactly it. That is exactly it. Because she, she's not quite to her 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 sadist. You know, I want to skin dogs for coats thing. Uh, she, she's just trying to try to fight her way to the top and. Uh, she does it by the end of the movie, and uh, that's what you expect because it's a it's a prequel. Um, <clears throat> I haven't watched much else that I can recall. I I watched a lot of stuff since the last record, which is a long time ago. If you listen to those old, those episodes I've been putting out, uh, they've been <laughs> they're from we recorded them a little bit ago. Um, one thing I did watch uh, that was an older movie, a Ital- very Italian, very. Uh, I think cautionary tale is so maybe you show this to your teenage daughters you want to be go skanking around. Uh, what have you done to their daughters? I watched, which was a wild little Italian film about teen girls who have a sex ring and are getting picked off one by one by a guy in a motorcycle helmet with a massive cleaver. And um, that's a that's a that's wild not movie. Not a euphemism. All right, well, it's not, not a euphemism. Not at all. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's, it's not phallic at all. This massive cleaver, no. And uh, he's go with it though. Um, but um, boom, <laughs> but um, boom. I did enjoy the hell of it. Though. I thought it was good all the way to the end, except for the the weird, a tough score. You know, when the killer is about, they make this score happen, and it, it, it's fine. But the film is really good, and um, not much else to really talk about in that sense. Man, it's, it's been a while though with uh, with uh, with us, X. Uh, Anything in the world, you know, besides the WWE just dropping the ball over the place that's really bugging you, dude? Nah. <laughs> nah. No. Nah. 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 I mean... <laughs> I had to say besides the WWE dropping the ball because, you know, I just stray away from that. Because no, honestly, it's... You know, it's just... They, they, that's their job now. That's what they do. They just fuck shit up, and that's, that's, that's all they do. Um, no, I'm actually feeling... A, I was telling you before the show, I'm a little bit low energy... Um, cause I got the, uh, I won't blame it on the vaccine is what I'm going to do. And I think I'm going to use that excuse just for everything from now on. Like, you know, why didn't you do the dishes? Oh, it's the, it's the vaccine, dude. Vaccine. There Vaccine's you go. got, it's, vaccine got it's, down. <laughs> it's the, it's the stab as they call it in the UK, which I love to yeah. call it the stab. <laughs> we got our jabs. Oh, the jabs. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah, yeah another for- Probably stuff has pissed me off, and I'm just too busy, you know, sweating. sweating. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sweating it out, man. My, my, my old guapo has allergies, but that's that's this time of year. But, you know, uh, tonight, uh, Suzanne's not here tonight because she's 
she's day drinking with her friend and you know that's that's summertime too i love her to death though she's gonna pop in later to, to give her opinion of these films is she programmed for the show you lazy cow starting out there you know <laughs> but we're, we're doing what uh the legacy from uh 1974 yeah and the mephisto waltz from 1971 both uh Films with uh, devil packs, I guess you would call them, and something hilarious happens on a roof, and you know, kiss the rings, <laughs> bitch, in one of them. Oh my gosh, we'll go we'll do this chronologically, you know, because the plaster is getting harder and all that good stuff. Don't sue us, kiss, or something like that. Um, Mephisto Waltz <laughs> from 71 would do first, <laughs> right after the trailer. <laughs> When was the last time you were afraid? Really afraid? Mephisto Waltz, the devil dancing with his paramours. Mask of Miles. I'm not my husband's keeper. The Mephisto Waltz, a story of inner fear and ritual terror, and the ultimate transplant, the human soul. Bye, Miles. Mommy? He said he had to kill her. Some kind of bargain. Who? Duncan Eli. And now Duncan's dead. But you play like him. How did his brain get into your fingers? Paula, you're living in a nightmare. People who pray to the devil. Paula. Is it possible? Who are these people of the occult? What is their incredible power over others? How long does it take them to drive a woman out of her mind? The terrifying answers come each time you hear the Mephisto Waltz, the sound of terror. You killed Bill. You killed Happy. Now you want to kill me. Don't you play like him. How did his brain get into your thing? We're living in a nightmare. People who pray to the devil. Is it possible? It is possible. The Mephisto Waltz of 1971. Uh, your cheapo plot synopsis is this. An old, dying Satanist arranges to transfer his soul into the body of a young concert pianist. You know. Basically, if Hawkeye, oh, I'm sorry, so like they do, like they do, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it starts out in Jacqueline Bissett. Uh, stupid thing, <laughs> it's supposed to be. I, lo- I lost the screen, so you know, those two people started this movie, and I'm sure some other folks will, will, will tell us. Uh, so some other folks that I don't even know who they are, so oh dear, it's not fair, but um, um, basically, the plot of this film is you know. What if Hawkeye gave all of his, you know, surgical uh, ambitions to become a concert pianist for the for the devil, you know, unassumedly because you know they switch souls or something, uh, a la Free Jack so many years later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff X, I'll start with you. What do you think of the Mephisto Waltz, sir? I think that it's always a lot of fun to go back and look at the stuff that Alan Alda did before the Mash TV show. Um, I really like To Kill a Clown. Um, the Moonshine War is decent. And then there's this one. Yay, the Mephisto Waltz. And it fascinates me that Alda, who, you know, he was very pro-feminist, um, very much a woman's women's rights advocate. And in this movie, he's wanted specifically for his body. The old dying piano player, you know, wants to infuse his soul into Alda's body like it's, like, like 
you know, cucumber water or some shit, but it's, but it's just because of his hands. He sees all those hands and he's like, oh my. <laughs> right? Ooh. Like, Can I look at your hands? I don't fucking look at people's hands because that's creepy. You know, <laughs> you don't, don't just start staring at people's digits and start talking about how beautiful they are. That's weird. And then at the end, um, Jacqueline Bissett does what she does because she wants Alan Alda's body, regardless of who's inside of it. So he's just a that's piece of That's creepy. He's just a piece of meat in this movie. Nobody cares what he thinks. He's just a vessel, and he also stores pee in his balls. Um, now, another fun thing about this movie is, for me anyway, you can always tell how creepy and powerful the Satanists are by how big the parties they throw are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's a New Year's party in the Mephisto Waltz that kind of needs to be seen to be believed. It's, it's up there with that birthday party in the Sentinel. And um, the weird baby shower at the end of Rosemary's Baby. So, yeah, the party scene really just needs to be observed for its overall weirdness. But I have a question about this movie. And it's the actual method of murder. See, the Satanists, you know, of being crazy Satanists, they go around fucking killing people that might get in the way of the grand plan. But the way they kill people is they put this blue oil on their forehead. And it looks a lot like acrylic paint, but if it touches you, you die. My thing is, Jacqueline Bissett touches the blue oil on other people's foreheads at least twice. Why didn't she die right away? Why did she stick around till the end of the movie? I mean, shouldn't it... It seems like it'd be like touching some form of, of acid or something, like there'd still be some power in it. So, I don't know. It seems like she should have been dead 45 minutes out of this movie, which would have changed the outcome dramatically. I was also really glad to see, see Pamela and Ferdin in this movie as Alda and Bissett's daughter. Now, she did a lot of TV back in the 70s, um, did a lot of crying. She cries in this movie, too. And she is an ugly crier. It is difficult to watch her have emotions. So, I don't know. This is a fun movie, but I had a lot of problems with it, so I can't really recommend it freely. I thought that ending was sketch. And um, it's got a quick pace, which is nice, but I think at least four times there are like these weird dream sequences which might be hallucinations or visions or something like that but it's hard to tell what the point of view is of those visions like who's having them where it's i think i think at one point it's like from the point of view of a cat like i don't know if wes craven saw this movie before he made hills have eyes part two and thought this is a great idea so there's a really weird disconnect there they're expository sequences, but they're all just so dis- disjointed. They don't make a lot of sense contextually to me. So the film's really uneven, and it's okay, but it's not going to be anything I'm going to revisit anytime soon unless I just get sick and can't find the prices right. <laughs> oh, man. Iris. All right. So Mephisto Watts, it's been a while since I've seen this. Um but uh, being that, you know, I like Alan Alda. Alan Alda, I, I really do. Um, and who doesn't want to stare at Jacqueline Bissett and those beautiful eyes of hers? Oh, uh, I, didn't get, I, didn't, I didn't get that high. Well, you yeah, didn't you get, get that see, you, you get to see Nip in the, in the, in the deep, right? Yes, yeah, that works. yes you do. Immediately, yeah. Yes, you do. Um, it's interesting, okay? To me, this is a good, interesting movie. I, you know... If it's on, I will sit and watch it. Uh, there is, like you said, there's a few, uh, I don't know, plot holes or just just stuff, continuity issues, like with the blue stuff. Um, but um, at the time, I'd have to say I would give props to any movie who kills a kid, which you know <laughs> they did. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and she cried about it. And she cried about it exactly. Um, and like you were saying, this movie, it's its really all about the vessel. Uh, nobody care, cares, you know, what Ellen Aldo wants. Um, or um, I should say Miles. Nobody cares what Miles wants. Uh, everybody wants Miles' body. And at the end, what Roxanne 
or, or Paula does, you know, um, which I find very interesting. She, she still, she knew that that was not her husband, Miles. It was Miles's body. But apparently, no, Duncan, the old man, must be a better lover or something because he, she was obviously enjoying him a hell of a lot more than she was enjoying Miles. Uh, for real. So uh, could it be because, you know, he was going to be this, this famous, awesome person or whatever? I don't know. But it, it is a really, you know, when you sit and think about it, it's a really fucked up ending. It really, really is. But, yeah, you know, these movies, these movies are great. And, and um, something like the Mephisto Waltz, it, it's kind of like it, it's been replayed so many times. And the Mephisto Waltz is, is basically a replay of, I don't know, way back in 1920, vice versa. You know, the, the, there's a, a popper who switches with a rich kid and they switch bodies and, you know, so it's basically the same thing. We have, um, angel heart, we have skeleton key, you know, movies like that. And I think it, it, it's in the canon. I don't know. Could it be in the canon of of these swap movies? Yeah, but there's better ones. I would have to say kind of like, you know, freaky Friday. That was kind of interesting or goodbye, Charlie, but it doesn't have this satanic twist to it. Um, but you know, I still enjoy the movie. So, so yeah, that's pretty much me. Would freaky Friday have been better with a satanic twist? I think it would have been wonderful. Can you imagine watching goodbye, Charlie? And the only reason that Charlie ended up in the woman's body was because he did some satanic thing and the <laughs> devil goes, okay, kind of like a Wishmaster, okay, Wishmaster, you know, and he's like, oh, oh so you yeah. want this. All right, I'll give it to you, but in a fucked up way. <laughs> yeah, so, but not the way you want that. But not the, so. He's like, you know, <clears throat> what is it? One of my favorite lines is in Wishmaster is, well, you got to get past me. And boom, he turns him into a glass, <laughs> a glass oh. wall. <laughs> Well, the only reason why right Wishmaster Wishmaster works so well is because DevOps sells it so well. That, oh, that's, uh, I know, doesn't he? Doesn't he? He's just awesome. But yeah, that jawline requires not much makeup. I tell you right now, I've met him in person. He looks like the devil who makes beer. Apparently, you know. Oh dear. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, me. I, I it's the first time watch for me. I, I dug the film quite a bit. I, I like the whole idea of. Uh, the transference of, of soul through the plaster thing. It's not really explained, but you get it, you know, especially in the end of the movie. It's like, yep, gotcha. You know, it's one of those gotcha moments because she, she made a deal with the Dark Lord and, yeah, get, getting it in, you know, tr- trying to sort of save her, man. I don't know, does she have the cast of his face that's going to bring him back? I, I, I don't know how this works. Um, There was a similar uh, Tales from the Crypt type, I think it was a Tales from the Crypt episode where, Leah Thompson wanted to stay beautiful forever, so she had some pawn pawn shop guy or something slash spiritual guru or something. I think Peter Spellos played him in the in the in the episode. It sounds about right. But he made a plaster cast of her face, and the twist, of course, is that she started to get very old all at once, and so she had the cast, and she broke the cast, so she can not be beautiful anymore at all, because all she had left was the cast. But whatever, it doesn't apply here, but maybe it does. Um, I, I make comments about the, all the great shots of the eyes in this movie, like they're the windows to the soul, if you will. And I think that was a metaphorical, but very obvious at the same time. Um, Alan, all those massive hands, just showing you how he plays piano real well, kind of, um, that may be the first time I've ever heard anybody say Alan, all massive hands. Well, they show them like, like, like they're freaking like the biggest hands you ever seen in your life on the screen. Just to show you, this man's got some big old hands right here, which wouldn't help you as a, as, as a surgeon. That's all I'm, all I'm gonna say about that one. If you had those that big of a hands, well, I got him some ham hocks. That's some ham hocks, man. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> Keep all your surgeries to Trapper John. God damn it, you know. Um, Trapper John had huge hands. Yeah, well, well, they, they're they're bad doctors, that apparently, you know, goddamn <laughs> Korean, goddamn Korean conflict. We failed to achieve victory, America. Just throw it out there, you know. No, I'm playing. Maybe we did. I don't know. I, I give up. That show was that show was too long for that small conflict, but it is what it is. Yay, Hawkeye. But the Mephisto Waltz was um, it was it was a good time for me, and for as long as it was, 
and I, I got to mention this for, for Jamie Salmon's sake, had a pretty bang and Jerry Goldsmith uh, um, score going on in it. I love it. Uh, yeah, I have more to say about the next film, but I, 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 it's, it's hard to say that I don't recommend this movie because I think you should watch it at least once because uh, it is all over the place. They do kill a child with uh, the, the blue the blue dye number four or something. I don't even know. <laughs> I, I don't even know. It's not really explained what that stuff is. It's just kind of like, hey, you put it on the forehead, and all of a sudden, they're going to die. And then they kill that child. Who's You know why they killed that child, right? Because that, that, that hideous green dress she was wearing at the beginning of the movie. you know, like, <laughs> Or maybe because she was, was crying the, because of the dog. Crying because of the dog and the hideous green dress. Uh, Stealed her fate in, in the satanic uh, eyes. Blue and, oil applied directly to forehead. <laughs> Blue oil applied directly to forehead. That's 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 the instructions on that. <laughs> so then she's got you know she's got the the power of the dark lord in her apparently. So I think she's immune to the blue oil at that point or plot point. I I don't know. She has been imbued somehow because she's been starting some shit. But um, Mephisto Waltz, yay! If you haven't heard Court Sibs and Mad Sibs review on the Cinema Sibs, uh, go check that out too. They they go much deeper on this film, and uh, cause that's what they do. We just talk about the film on here, and uh, that's fine too. I'll kick it to the the Iris and ask her anything else she likes to say about the film, and uh, would she give it one to ten? Um, I think I pretty much said what I was gonna say. It's it's interesting. It's oh a, I mean it, it it's it's something that there's so many movies about this, but it was an interesting twist to it because in the end. The chick doesn't care. So uh, I'm going to give it a seven. Cool. X. I'm going to give it a six. And that's boosted up just because of the party scene. <clears throat> I think it just trips itself up too much to leave much of an impression. I'm I'm, pr- I'm probably a devil movie snob, but eh. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. What, what had a better party scene? This Rosemary's Baby or Dracula AD 1972? Oh shit! I forgot about Dracula AD nineteen seventy two. Yeah, that one's good too. Um, damn, because they brought they brought a rock band with them to that. They to that did. Party. <laughs> they absolutely did. They knew where the popos were coming. They had they had <laughs> locked down, man. You know. <laughs> oh, Car- Carolyn psych- Monroe was there. Psychedelic Dracula. My God, how oh, how I miss those days. Um, yeah, the Dracula party was better than this one. I still give yes. Mephisto Wall to six. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I gotta give it a seven. I mean, this is like, this is like satanic gone girl going on, especially the end where she's trying to get her, her revenge of sorts, I guess. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, there's no, there's no killing Neil Patrick Harris, uh, sexually in bed, you know, but it, it, there, there is that ending to say, you know what, I guess this is the way it is. And you know what? The next film kind of has that ending too, to say, well, I guess, you know, I got to settle. I'm talking to you, Sam Elliott. We're talking about you next. Um, but yeah, that's about it for this one. Uh, we're going to go on to our next feature, which is uh, Crazy Cats are about, um, yeah, the legacy from 1978. Right after this. One second. <laughs> Jason Mount Olive is a man with many friends. Jason will give you such wealth. To each he has given anything. He will fulfill every whim. And everything. With every fancy. They've ever desired. Every dream. Trust Jason. Now they've been reunited for one last time. <laughs> each to receive one last gift. The legacy. When he calls us, we come. <laughs> Six have come to claim his inheritance. Five discover the lifeless body. Four watch in horror as another dies. Then there were three. Then two. But only one can receive the legacy. Catherine Ross.
Ross, Sam Elliott, and Roger Daltrey, The Legacy, a birthright of living death. The Legacy of 1978, uh, your cheapo IMD plot synopsis is this. An American couple in England stumble upon a rambling, a rambling mansion. What is it fucking going on? Uh, never mind. Where uh, <laughs> a number of powerful <laughs> individuals have been summoned by a Spanish yard regarding the home's legacy. Because, you know, long ago, you know, when the rings were forged, some were given to the elves, some were given to the dwarf lords, and some were given to a race. Of, but there was one ring that was made in secret. And that That's was right. that ring. I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm going off tangents here. I'm doing this for X because you know Lord of the Rings, but <laughs> because they were all of them deceived. Hey, Doss, there you go. There you go. He's got it, man. BS yeah, film is all about kids in the rings. Uh, this film stars Sam Elliott and his his future or current wife in this movie, uh, Catherine Ross. Future. They met on set. Okay, so future wife, uh, still very mustached and very. Uh, very masculine on a motorcycle. That's where I first saw him, too, on a motorcycle. Oh, man. This stars Roger Daltrey for no reason. Uh, Charles Gray, <laughs> who some of you guys may know as um, the narrator from um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. And um, <laughs> had a bigger part in shock treatment, just throwing it out there. Um, yeah, this, this is a fun film. I'll kick it to X first uh, to tell us about some rings and some, some pussy and some... Uh, some freaky looking old men dying again. You know, it wasn't a Go better for it, X. Roll. It wasn't a better role in shock treatment. It was bigger. I mean, it was better. <laughs> Suck that movie. Um, <clears throat> I like this movie really a lot. It feels like an old hammer horror movie, except they're Americans in the lead roles. And, you know, they're not loud, stupid Americans. For the most part, they make pretty rational decisions and they, they speak calmly and they don't just kind of throw their Americanness all over the place. So yeah, Sam Elliott and Catherine Ross are really, really good in this movie. Um, yeah, they got married a few years after this movie finished filming. I think it was like six years, eight years. Can't remember. It was, they, they, they dated for a while before that, but the legacy has got all the standard trappings of a hammer movie. It's got the, <laughs> the big house in the English countryside. Lord, it was born a rambling mansion. Um, it's got the somewhat sketchy staff of domestic help, and it's got maybe the best indoor pool I've seen since Argento's Suspiria. But for me, seeing Roger Daltrey was just big happy for me. I mean, Gary, you know what a huge Who fan I am, and I know you are too. I'm well, always happy. Guess. Yeah, I'm always happy to see Daltrey pop up in a movie, even when they have to give him, you know, a surprise tracheotomy. Um, but that's just another part of this movie's mysterious curse of um, I don't who gets to be Satan I guess that's what this is about because I th I think that's what's happening if you if you get the ring if you get the magical signet ring then you get all of the devil powers <clears throat> and what's funny about it is obviously this ends with Catherine Ross getting the ring and she doesn't seem like the Satanist type but I guess you know, you just never know what you'll do until you're in that situation. This was Richard Marquand's first movie, and he did Return of the Jedi, which is probably my least favorite Star Wars movie. And I reckon he got the job because having to direct that damn cat got him ready for directing all the Ewoks. It's not a bad movie by any stretch, but it does have kind of that slow pace like the old Hammer movies have. So it's not really action-packed, but if you're kind of chilling on the couch and want to see Roger Daltrey choke on a chicken bone, you know, when he was eating ham, then <laughs> I can't, here you go. Um, but again, the, we, we got to talk about the ending again, like we did for Mephisto Waltz, because at the end of it, okay, so the way the curse works is that whoever wears the ring has to choose six other people so that when the time comes, they all come to the rambling mansion or whatever, and I guess whoever's left at the end gets the ring, and then they get to inherit the the devil powers. But the first person that Catherine Ross picks is Sam Elliott. Now, how's that going to affect your relationship, you know? Like, she's the devil, and at some point, she's going to be like, oh, by the way, honey, at some point, you'll need to be mysteriously killed inside the house, and you'll be shot to death with an unloaded gun, or you'll be run over by a motorcycle that has no driver. Sorry about that. Let's go have some tea. Doesn't make oh. any sense. 
at that point, he kind of knew what was going on anyway. So when she says, when he says, if I put this ring on, I won't be able to take it off, will I? Well, yeah, because it's the fucking devil's ring, dude. So he does it anyway. So he set up for, for, for a ritzy, rambling mansion and his satanic wife. Yeah, and an eventual violent, nonsensical death. Eventually, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure if I agree with that sort of payoff. <laughs> anyway, I liked it. I liked it more than the Mephisto Waltz. So there. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Iris. Okay, so I remember going to the movie theater to watch this um, for the first time. And um, I found the movie intriguing as a kid. I mean, I was 10, but I was already pretty much into the world of kaiju horror and sci-fi by then. And I, I enjoyed the movie. And uh, being the kid that I was, I went to the library and snuck into the adult side and grabbed the book, which was even better. Because there were things that I was introduced in that book as a child that I was like, oh, I didn't know the body did that. Um, but anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I like this because I like I like the plot. I like the idea of somebody inheriting said power whether it be used for good or evil power is power and it corrupts. So you can never say that you'll use your power for e uh, for good because eventually, you know, good in the name of evil is still evil. Right. Uh, so I like movies with these kind of plots and I really like the idea that it was, you know, Maggie who ended up with powers and yet her boyfriend, Sam Elliott or Pete knew what was going on. Like you said, but I guess he, he felt that he had a chance of one in six. That's not bad odds, if you think Listen, about it. If you see her demeanor at the end of the movie, though, when she, when she when after she gets the ring, the the the, the ring of power, you know, the the one the one ring, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> she she's she's very self aware that she she has she has these powers that she could develop these powers. Cause she kind of has like a smirk on her face, like like she knows she knows she's all powerful now, and it's it's kind of like exactly. yeah, you, See, you're so, with me. and he figures he's either with her or he's against her at that point. Exactly. So you know, I think th this is more of the better the devil that you know, because if she gets bitchy and she does have inherent powers, then his chance of being the one to inherit those powers one in six are pretty much gone because he knows that he will die. Period. So, you know, it's one of those keeping, you know, you keep your friends close and your enemy, you know, keeping your enemy close. I, uh, th that's how I see it. I just think that really sucks any sort of, you know, equitability out of a relationship because obviously she's got the power and he doesn't. So he's going to have to spend his life being subservient to her until he eventually is, you know, shot in an errant game of skeet. There you go. But if you really think about it, um, if you take a look at their relationship, I guess you really don't get to see much. But in the book, he was the one that pulled all the strings with everything. So it's kind of like a flip of a switch there. And maybe it's just maybe a little bit of karma where she had no say of where the business was going or what deals that they were going to make. So therefore, maybe, you know, Maybe there's that. And it, maybe it's something that really gets missed in the movie, but not in the book. Because, you know, you, you can put just so much. You don't want to bore the audience to death. It's kind of like you were saying. It is kind of like it's a hammer. It was kind of like a hammer film. And um, the guy who did um, uh, Jimmy Sangster, <clears throat> excuse me, Jimmy Sangster was um, what I'm seeing here on, on um, Wikipedia, uh, you know, such a reliable source. He was a little bit dismayed that it was, it looked like a Hammer movie because that's not what he wanted. But I think it really works because that's what, you know, at that time, that's what we were used to seeing. We were used to seeing that decrepit English place with characters that were kind of shady and you were kind of trying to figure out who was the good guy and who was the bad guy. And, you know, so, yeah, you know, in, in this, everybody's a bad guy. Mm hmm. You know? I mean, they they openly admit it. It's not like exactly. a question of the whole time you're pretty much self aware of these people are up to fishy things. And about I say about a good forty minutes into the movie, especially when Roger Daltrey makes 
his, his grand appearance with that, his luscious locks that he basically uh-huh. said that he sold his soul to the devil to become a rock star. He, he sold, yeah. you know, he, 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 they pulled no punches about who, who they are, what they are. It's just a matter of the old man is dying and he claims they're there to bury him. But little do they know that they, that he's there to bury them because he has a whole other plan. They had to, well, I don't know. Maybe they weren't smart enough. But yeah, I think they're, that's where I think a, a Pete or, or Sam Elliott's character is at, where he's like, well, if I'm going to make a, de- a deal with the devil, then then let's do this. It's it's either, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So, like, if I'm going to make a deal with the devil, at least I've seen her tits. Exactly. Mm-hmm. There okay. you go. You know, if I'm going to make a deal with the devil, I should at least be able to fuck him. Ta-da. <laughs> and as long as she's imbued with magical powers, he doesn't, like, burn the rose to make her upset too much, you know? Or, uh... Exactly. Be- because you know he's going to get something out of this too because he's basically selling his soul to the devil by putting that ring on so sure. maybe you know maybe sure. he's going to be you know a world renowned interior decorator then sure he's not okay as, with that turn sure on his Perry Como record during his birthday her, her birthday party and you know <laughs> what happens then you know yeah I'm <laughs> saying that, that he's fucking Anthony Fremont from the 12 episode you know he's, she's going to wish him into the cornfield people there you go. Eventually, that is what's going to happen, and he knows this. But I think he's like, well, I might as well live it up while I can. That's all the Sam Elliott there is. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'd be so sad. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is a very entertaining movie for me. This is another one that I can sit and watch whenever it's on. Which you know, when I was a kid, it was on HBO quite a bit. Now nowadays, it's not. But um, I do own it, so there you go. Nice, nice. Uh, I dug this quite a bit. I dug it better than Mephisto Walls, but that's not even an insult to that movie. Um, I, I like the way the movie, this movie moved. I mean, I think that the Hammer-esque mansion worth its favor as far as isolation goes. There's points in the film where they're trying to get out of Dodge and they can't because of, of the isolation and and maybe the Devil having a point of, of uh, their exit. I don't know. Um, yeah, a lot of great character actors in here doing great things and I love I love the fact, like I said before, no one really pulls any punches about who they are. It's just like, yeah, by the way, we made a pact with this, and we all wear these rings, and, and you know, all of a sudden their friends start getting bumped off, but they're not really friends. They just happen to be put together by these rings, because nobody seems like crazy friendly, because Homegirl dies in the pool, because the transducer that um, Frankenfurter invented made, made a glass uh, case amongst the swimming pool, and she she she, she died, you know. <laughs> The uh, transducer will set loose, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, she dies world-class swimmer, and, you know, they say they're right away, you know, a woman wouldn't die that way. That was a world-class swimmer, but, you know, the transducer did its job. Um, the cat, the, the well, the cat slash nurse, maybe you laugh out loud, but you find out the cat is the nurse, because constantly there's this group of cats walking around, and there's one prominent white cat. That happens to be this nurse because when, when Sam Elliott, the P character, gets a hold of her, starts shaking her around, she starts aud- she starts audibly me- meowing, and I can't stop laughing. I can't stop laughing because she she is the cat apparently. <laughs> it's like this is just this dumb, but whatever. It is what it is. She's the constant, you know, presence, you know, spying on things like cats do. My cat's laying right next to me right now. I just wonder what I'm doing right now. When we going to bed, asshole? You know. Just tell me not so many words. It, it's just something the cats do. Uh, the scene <laughs> after people are getting bumped off and they're trying to escape again, where homeboy is on the roof with the elephant gun, trying to gun down our our, our lovely couple. That was All crazy. and, and that was Sam Elliott gets a crossbow. Okay. All I can think about is the American Gladiators. I'm waiting for Mike Adley to tell me the fucking rules of assault. Okay. I'm waiting for it to happen. <laughs> As soon as he grabs a crossbow, I'm waiting for him to get to the station where they have he would have random rocks to throw at him, but he does tag him with the crossbow because it's Sam Elliott. Of course he could fire a crossbow and aim correctly. And you know, that's just the majesty of Sam right there. That's not Satan at all. That's just manliness. And uh I, I have to think that way because again, it's always been in my life since since, since the movie Mask, where he was Gar. And wear a T-shirt that says somebody who who wants to who who wants a mustache ride. And I'm like, yeah, I can see it. Get it in. Come on, man. You know, 
and this uh this movie's case get it in for satan because he settles i i've said this uh countless times in other situations i about people who should settle in films he knew where his place was he is now a trophy husband to beelzebub and i think he's fine with that and um i i like i like that ending because <laughs> he knew where he stood uh, this uh this chick uh she's got magical powers and shit now i better straight up and fly right if you will and he does apparently because that's that's the end of the movie he he accepts he he kisses the ring accepts the ring and i uh i dig it i had a big old who done it vibe to it but but not really too much of a mystery of who's doing it because of course it's the guy that's supposedly that that's dying upstairs who who gives her the ring all prince of darkness style i was waiting for her to reach her hand through a mirror not just because <laughs> not just because of tommy she smashed the mirror then see but then the, incre- the, the incredible aim of donald pleasance with the axe in that movie smashes the mirror no problem uh so i guess it works both ways we love you Anne margaret i promise to god okay but uh <laughs> i mean who would a- love a woman that you know dances and bathes and does things in you know Pork and beans. Pork Baked and beans. beans. Exactly. Yeah. Oh man, king's beans fit for a queen. Apparently. Oh my goodness gracious! Pork and beans. That's nasty. And tr- like you know, eating cake in an orgy. That's another movie though. Um. Yeah, this movie's fun. I, I had a good time with it. This is the second time I've seen it, and uh, liked the first time. Uh, liked it a little more the second time, especially with all the. American Gladiator stuff in that one scene. I, I, I was laughing my ass off. It's all I thought about. That possibly Nitro was at the, the tennis ball gun waiting for him. Because <laughs> everybody knows that Nitro was the best at it, okay? Oh, my gosh. Nitro and Zap for the ladies. I'm going to leave that at that, though. And uh, kick it to you. Iris. Anything, any last words? And what do you give a 1 to 10? Um, I pretty much said everything that I was going to say about this movie. It's fun. It's enjoyable. Uh, you know, it's one of the best, one one of the better uh, devil packed movies. Um, I would give this one an eight point five. Cool X. Well, I was going to give it a, a seven, but the the adulteryness showed up and boosted that score. So I'm going to go with Iris and give it an eight point five. That is a magical smile, though, isn't it? You know, it is. <laughs> what a Man. what a charming motherfucker. Man, oh man, oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna give it an eight. I, I, I dug it quite a bit. Like I said, I'm gonna watch it again, and um, one of these days, not right now or anything. But um, these are both recommends for you to watch. Probably one, one over the other one, but still, they're both enjoyable. And um, after this, we'll get Suzanne's thoughts on uh, both of these films because she could not be here. Bye bye. <laughs> Suzanne's here. This is the show that she programmed, so I'm glad that she's here. And uh, she's going to tell us about Mephisto Waltz first, so uh, tell us about it, Sue. Well, once again, I just absolutely love the satanic 70s horror movies. It's just, it's kind of like one of my favorite sub subsets of movies because, I don't know, it was just everything was new and different, and there was, you, you could, ha- there was sex, there was nudity, there was drugs, and excessive alcohol abuse and this movie is just one of my favorites for i didn't watch it for the longest time because i never really cared for alan alda and i finally broke down one day because it was like on a lot of 70s lists that i of people that i I, you know i i i get it yeah yeah oh my god people 70s people that you should like yes uh uh-huh so, and I finally broke down and watched this movie, and oh my god, I was so blown away by it. Alan Alda, I never really could picture him playing something like this, because he was always Hawkeye. Yep. And just seeing him, you know, go from this you know, kind of, I, I don't even want to say mild-mannered music journalist to, you know, being possessed by... We're actually having his body taken over by a dying Satanist and using his hands. And it's it's just one of those bizarre-ass movies. And it's kind of funny that when I was watching it again, 
once again, we have a, a dog with a human face on it. In this case, it's just a mask, thank God. It's still uh, creepy enough as it is. And then you have the the the, uh, the death bringing blue goo. But yeah, this yeah. movie just has it just has all the all the right pieces to it that makes it. I, I want to. It's it's definitely a, a true horror movie from beginning to end. It has it doesn't really stray into any other territories. I I have to admit. I mean, it took me several years to watch it for. On top of the fact I didn't like Alan Alda, it just kind of sounded boring. But it definitely is not boring. Yeah. And from the plot description, though, it does sound kind of dull. But you know, once you get a nitty gritty of uh, the betrayal, and, you know what's going on with the plaster faces and all that crazy stuff, and it, it really holds together. You know. Mm-hmm. Oh, it does, and you know that that little twist with. Jacqueline Vissette at the end I was like I have to admit that that the first time I saw this movie that kind of caught me off guard because I mean she knew right off the bat something was just off about these people and Alan Alda's character he really is kind of like a a fame seeking I don't don't want to say gold digger per se but you know he was always looking for that that mass appeal that he didn't have when he was actually a pianist. And he just kind of found his way into that. And Duncan Eli gives him all that access and the prestige, the money. Because, I mean, after Duncan died and leaves him this chunk of change, what is the first thing he does? Goes and buys a Mercedes. And the one thing they, they really did well with this movie was when their daughter died oh he just he literally just didn't care it was part of the pact he only cared about that fame and fortune and i don't think he realized that it was basically his own soul he was giving up but she jacqueline Bissett was so in love with her husband and she made her own pact but it's such such an incredibly well made movie, and I can't really say that about modern movies like this. They they don't exist anymore. They're thrown together, you know, haphazardly and dread or misfortune or you have none of that. So that's why I just love this set of movies. So this one, I I just I just love it. So what is a one to ten then, Sue? You know, I, I want to say 10. I just, I, I really, I, I'm pretty much going to say it, like nine and a half. It's just because Alan Alda's in it, and I don't like him, but he's really good in this. <laughs> but yeah, I'm at nine and a half on this one, and it's just, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Cool. Uh, now let's talk about Pussy Rings and Rock and Roll uh, with Legacy. Thoughts, girl? Oh, my God. This one is, this one's just... It's it's just kind of fun. It's it, it once again it does stay in the horror territory and mostly in horror territory. But there's just a few things. But I always love the charisma between Sam Elliott and Catherine Ross. I mean, they've been married for fucking ever, and they're you know they're they get this job opportunity of a lifetime. To go and do archi- you know, do architecture work and design in this in this English manner, which you know, hey, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. And they accidentally get sideswiped, and they wind up at the manner that they're supposed to be going to with this very bizarre cast of characters. You know, the characters in the movie, each and every one of them, yeah, you just kind of find interesting. I've always appreciated that about this movie, even though you don't get much time with any of them. They really take pains to make sure you know who these people are. And the way that they get killed off one by one is, you know, the same way that they've had their own past indiscretions. And I just, I I really, one of my favorite parts of this movie is Roger Daltrey. I mean, he chews up the scenery for, what, about the 15 minutes he's in it? Yep. And so does everybody else in the movie. And 
There is, I think there is one guy who was in, I think his last name was Hogg. Uh, now, great, now I got to look. Uh, yeah, Ian Hogg. I believe he was in the original Mod Squad. No, he wasn't in the Mod Squad. Oh, there's something I saw him in, and now I'm going to go brain dead and break my phone trying to figure out what the hell it was. <laughs> But yeah, <clears throat> this one is just, it's fun, you know? You, she is like the reincarnation of this 17th century witch. I, I always love and, it when there's, when there's a random painting in a film. This one looks just like her, and that's why they chose her. That that's uh, It's almost too perfect, you know? Oh, it is completely, completely too perfect. Now, I was thinking of something else, but... It's, it's not implausible, though, because if I look at my cousin Jonathan... I look at a teenage picture of my, my grandfather. They look exactly alike, and it's kind of freaking scary. Wow. How oh, Ian Hogg was in Doctor Who. Okay. I have no idea why I, I was obsessing on that, but that's Cause, okay. Because we lost Clarence Williams III. That's why, you know, go, go Mod Squad. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's probably how it got stuck in my head. She had it in her brain, y'all. She had Link on the brain, I, I, and I get it. I understand Oh, yeah, I have actually went back and watched a couple of episodes while I was at work, because that's pretty much where I live now. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I worked all day today for 50 cents. Damn. Yeah, I better I better see a bump in pay for this shit today. I got you. Uh, but go, go back to the movie now, you know. Okay, oh, sorry, that was a random no, interjection okay. there. It was a random interjection, and I'm not even shutting it down. <laughs> go, go for it, girl. But yeah, this movie, it, it, for me, this one is a little bit more tongue in cheek than the the Mephisto Waltz. But once again, you have I, I love I love the Devil Pact movies and the the Devil worshiping. There is just something about the satanic supernatural seventies movies. That, I mean, they just leave. There's just something there that you just can't help but if you're a horror movie fan, just uh, love. I mean that dark gothic manner on the countryside. I mean, I, I, I've, I've always disliked the trope, but you know that one where they're running around, they're trying to get away, and yet they're always back at the manor. It was cool as hell. I'll, I'll give them credit, but it's just one of those things. I just actually, it was probably, you know, it was probably one of the earlier movies that used it, but they do it all the goddamn time now. It, it, so it, it, I think just, it works here because of the isolation, though. Oh, it does. I mean, that's another thing that's, you know, really a door mystery. You have X amount of people in the house, and that's it. And cats. And all of Lots these. of cats. Yeah, that big white flip -a cat. And oh, I remember the first time I saw this, when, that, when she's invited up to that, their hospital room, and that hand comes out and slips that ring on her finger. The first time I saw it, I jumped about a mile. Because there was no music, you had no idea what was coming, but you did not expect that like weird ass look in hand to pop out. And I just, I, I just really dig it. It's like I said, more tongue in cheek than Mephisto Waltz. But this one, there's the ending, kind of cracks me up because she puts the ring on his finger, and he's like, "Well, alrighty then, here we are." And that's pretty much the end of the movie. But it's it's entertaining as hell. I mean, you the characters alone are worth the watch. It kind of, I mean, character-wise, it reminds me a little bit of the Sentinel because the characters, the you know, the outside characters were so interesting that it, it didn't matter if the movie started sucking. You were interested enough in the bizarre ass characters around that you you didn't care. But this one is a good enough movie. I enjoy the hell out of it. The isolation, that big old gothic manner, the deaths that occurred in the movie were fabulous. So this is another one. This is just a badass movie. More the, the Satanic 70s. Love them both. I'm glad I picked out these two movies because they work so well together. This one's a nine. What would you give this one, though? This one's a nine cool yeah they're both nine nine and a half they're and they, but they they play so well together in my opinion anyway that's fine um 
Yeah, that's it for this one, and we're going to come back and close out the show. Well, that's the end of this show. We want to want to welcome back our our friend, my my brother, Mr. Jeffrey X. Martin, to to the, to the fold here. It's a uh, I'm glad to have you, and uh, it's already making an impact on my soul, brother. I, I appreciate you, sir. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me back on. Uh, yeah, it's fun hearing all the, you know, hearing all the stuff you've been doing and everybody else been doing since we uh, took our little five year hiatus. But um, yeah, we're back up in it now. It's all good. Cool. Tell us about it, man. You're back. You see, you see, you guys, you see, you're afraid people didn't want to listen anymore. But that, that was a lie, you know. <laughs> it wasn't a lie. You know, was, that was a lie. I was just wrong. That's all there is to it. No, I thought, well, you know, because kids have been gone for five years. And I was like, well, shit, I don't know if we've got an audience anymore. I don't know. Things have changed. I don't know how stuff works now. But um, people were pretty excited when we when we came back. And we um, uh, put out uh, our latest episode a week ago, a couple weeks ago, about Mario Bava's Lisa and the Devil, which we thought was just a horrific mess. But then people have contacted us. They're like, hey, really like that movie. <laughs> it's like, well, whoops. whoops. <laughs> so, sorry, Lisa and the mannequins. You know, right. don't know. Uh, don't know what to tell you. Sorry about that. But <clears throat> so, yeah, we're back. We're on Legion. And, um, we try to get a show out every two weeks. Sometimes we don't. Like this new episode we're working on, I'm still working on it because we've been a little bit under the weather. <clears throat> but um, let's see. I've been kind of making the rounds. I was on an episode of no, no More Room in Hell, which I don't think is out yet, but it should be coming soon. And, you know, I'm, I'm here, obviously. So I don't know. I stammer when I talk about myself so i'm sorry <laughs> i should i should just stop now but listen to kiss the goat please you can find it wherever fine podcasts are sold like even on spotify and, and you know ask alexa about it and she'll probably play some ghost song for you do it iris well um let's see basically just on badasses booze and body counts um we just did elvira mistress of the dark and i did the synopsis on that one that was also fun. We were joined by uh, Lou. I and <laughs> it was lots of fun to do that one. Um, then uh, the next one that's coming up is going to be, believe it or not, we're finally doing this, Return of the Living Dead. Uh, so that's going to be fun. Uh, let's see. And then for Theme Warriors, right now what we have going is uh, parent-child movies. So real life parent and child in the movies and uh, some interesting movies that are going to be coming up. So we'll be recording that, I believe in about two weeks. So stay tuned. Cool. Yeah. This show, any show I'm on, uh, two drink venom commentaries and the brand new, which is recording um, this Wednesday, last call torchies, our big Walter Hill show. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing with Lee Russell and Cameron Scott. Uh, I'll be found on the regular, regular Legion feed and the Cinev feed and all that stuff. Uh, not on directly the Cinev feed. It's going to be on the Patreon feed. It's a show I just recorded today with uh, Derek Bourgeois from uh, Cinema Attack and the No More Room and No More Room in Hell podcast. Of course, uh, is he on? He's on the show, right? No, no, he's he's on Fresh Cuts and that. I forget what else. He does. He does. He wears many hats. That that Derek Bourgeois, but uh. We're doing film, a, a film, a show called Blood from the Core, which is all New York-based horror and thriller films. Every two weeks on the Patreon feed, we did the Sentinel first. It was a fun conversation about Rafey Burgess, Meredith, the Stroke of the Cat, and real freaks, and how much of a dickhead Michael Winner is to, to his cast, and Prue, and Dick Smith, and, you know. But yeah, uh, take up some residence there. Look for that. Um, it was a lot of fun to talk about with him. Um, every two weeks, the next episode we'll be doing past up. So no, we cue the winged serpent, and you know you got to you got to get the New York City royalty in there, Mr. Larry Cohen, just uh, early on, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that was real fun. I hope you guys enjoy that when it comes out. And um, that's about it for right now. And yeah, thanks for listening. 